which will be addressed. I also want to highlight that this session will be recorded and a replay will be available later uh, on the Chapter Zero France website. So climate change is the biggest challenge that we are facing today and that will shape the way that the world will be doing business in the coming decades. Links between climate change and businesses are becoming more and more important and evident. Decisions that the private sector make will impact the speed of the decarbonization that the world needs to see. Board knowledge and oversight is pivotal to assess the credibility, to challenge and to support the corporate responsibles to and the actions of their companies on this unprecedented challenge that climate change brings. The externalities of today are the opportunities of tomorrow and the potential loss in the future, if not internalized at the, and addressed at the right time. Tackling the climate crisis requires a multi-stakeholder approach and the need for all stakeholders from investors, public policymakers, civil society and companies to be involved and collaborate. But it does require the private sector to take responsibility to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at a scale and at a pace that is unprecedented. The question is no longer if this is needed, but more how. The private sector has to lead this global transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy. We have seen increased momentum in companies setting net zero targets. But do these companies know what is needed to get there in their respective industries? Earlier this week, we saw the publication of the Climate 100 benchmark of the world's largest corporate emitters. This showed that companies are increasingly making ambitious climate commitments, but now we want to see action. This session, this session is about how to get from target setting to the execution. With under 10 years to go until the intermediate 2030 deadline globally agreed in the Paris Agreement, we must ensure that we're advocating and driving true transformational change, not just incremental. It's the board's responsibility to oversee the execution of this decarbonization strategy and the disclosure that is required to hold up a mirror by stakeholders to these companies on their performance. So today we will explore various areas. We will look into how can companies operationalize the net zero strategy into an actionable trajectory with the need to set intermediate targets, including transition planning and reporting. We will look at how can we make sure that accountability mechanisms for decarbonization can actually contribute to the action and insights and recommendations for boards that are required to effectively steward the low carbon transition of their respective companies. We will also explore what the inevitable policy response is and how companies are supporting or hampering climate friendly policies. And how is this impacting the credibility of the net zero targets that the companies have set? Also, the role of investors and what they expect to see as actionable trajectory and disclosure of quantified risks and opportunities. They will assess and hold the board's involvement, their independence and expertise accountable, as seen by the, amongst others, the Climate Action 100 publications this week. Now, without further ado, I have the pleasure to introduce an esteemed panel that is here today. First of all, Romain Poivet, who is the coordinator of the ACT initiative at ADEM, the French National Agency for Ecological Transition. He will set the scene by introducing the Assessing Low Carbon Transition Initiative and how this can help ex executives to track their company's transition plan, the execution of that plan and the possibilities to steer and monitor. After this introduction of the ACT initiative, I will briefly introduce the World Benchmarking Alliance to you all to show how the ACT initiative has been operationalized into the publication of industry guidance and benchmarks. Then we have the pleasure to listen to Charlotte Gard, who is the deputy head of the sustainable finance at the Ministry of Economy and Finance here in France, who will elaborate on how the European sustainable finance plan is about to change the existing practices within companies and why this is important for you to know. And then last, but certainly not least, we have an open dialogue with Antonio Carrillo Doblado, who's the head of climate and energy at Lafarge Holcim. 
and on the challenges and also the opportunities within the transition that the cement sector is facing. This panel is hosted by the Chapter Zero France under the auspice of the World Economic Forum, and it's in the frame of the Climate Governance Initiative at the Global Summit. The Chapter Zero France is a platform and community that invites to learn and exchange experiences and challenges on climate change. The Chapter Zero France is supported by a prestigious industry leaders who are authentically committed to shifting the economy in line with the Paris Agreement. Now I give the virtual mic to Romain, who can elaborate on the action. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky, and good afternoon to everyone. I'm really pleased to be with you today. Um, my short presentation today is about the link between climate science and company strategies and how the ACT initiative can support decision makers to better understand, challenge and support companies on their decarbonization strategies. We can move to the next slide. Uh, just behind this funny cartoon, my underlying uh, message is obviously that companies should better bet on having climate expertise on their board than communication expertise. But obviously, they would need, uh, still need communication expertise anyway. Well, first, I should start to briefly explain uh, what the ACT initiative is about. And the ACT initiative, uh, launched at the COP21 uh, by ADEM and CDP, is the only international initiative of the UNFCCC Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action that really creates an accountability framework on sectorial methodologies to assess how company strategies and actions are contributing to the Paris Agreement mitigation goal. What is interesting to notice is that when we launched it back in 2015, some feedbacks we received were in one hand, you guys are crazy because nobody cares about the decarbonization strategy of companies. And in the other hand, you guys are amazing because we need this kind of approach to help companies board to understand the challenges. I think the other hand was more right when we see uh, that the TCFD or the European Plans for Sustainable Finance is requesting more transparency regarding company strategy. And more recently, the report from the European Platform on Sustainable Finance that recommends to establish or utilize tools or metrics outside the EU taxonomy to allow companies to demonstrate their transition plans, which is exactly what ACT allows to do. Basically, the ACT methodologies help to understand how companies implement relevant transition plans to tackle the decarbonization challenges. Say the other way around, it looks at the actual means that the company implements to reach its decarbonization targets in respect to its carbon budget. In practice, the ACT framework look at the commitment, the transition plan, the current action, the past action, and the consistency of the overall strategy. As you see, ACT is looking at the past, the present, and the future to have a good overall understanding of the company's trajectory. Basically, we are no longer looking only at the picture provided by the carbon footprint, but we are looking at the movie with a forward-looking perspective. This allows to produce a company assessment report with an associated ACT rating based on three dimensions, the performance score, the narrative score, and the trend score. I will only focus today on few components of the performance scores without detailing the underlying data and metrics, otherwise we will have to uh, stay all together all the afternoon, and I'm pretty sure you have other businesses to do. The performance score is based on verifiable quantitative and qualitative data that deal uh, with targets, material investment, R&D, sold product performance, management and governance, engagement all along the value chain, and implementation of new low carbon business models. Basically, an ACT assessment allows company st stakeholders such as investors or policymakers, but also company board members to understand, challenge, and support the company strategy from a decarbonization perspective. At this time, there are already more than 220 international companies engaged in the ACT initiatives in methodological developments, including road tests of the methodologies, but also hundreds of companies that have publicly available ACT score, thanks to the World Benchmarking Alliance and about 80 uh, companies that have also a non-publicly available score with associated assessment reports. And you can note that the company Decathlon 
has recently uh, and voluntarily published its act score uh, with a critical review from the third party. The sectors that are already covered by the act methodologies are electric utilities, retail, auto manufacturers, building and real estate, cement, transport, and oil and gas. Aluminium, glass, paper, and chemicals are under development. Iron and steel, agriculture, and agro-food industries are under road test with international pilot companies. And by the way, there are still room for companies that want to experiment for free uh, this, uh, these new methodologies. And all the road tests from, uh, all the learnings from those road tests will be available this fall. So you will probably uh, tell me that there are already uh, the TCFD recommendation and um, SBTI that answers the same question. But let me illustrate my speech with uh, the following image. Basically, uh, if the Paris Agreement mitigation goal was a marathon, while well, a company that wants to get aligned with the TCFD uh, is a company that uh, demonstrates uh, is a willingness, uh, not the willingness, because the, I'm sorry, the companies that transparently inform that it considers to run the marathon in order to secure and reassure the sponsor. A company that have set and validated the targets by the science-based target initiative is the company that has demonstrated that it actually wants to run the marathon. And an act, and a company that has an act assessment is the company that demonstrated that it will run uh, the marathon and that has a training program and the relevant equipment to successfully run this marathon. Knowing that uh, the, um, the sectorial, uh, sectorial decarbonization approach developed by the science-based target initiative is already embedded in act initiative. And the ACT initiative use uh, data and information on which TCFD or the EU taxonomy or the non-financial reporting directive request for more transparency. And I'm pretty sure that Charlotte Gard will probably tell you a few words about it uh, later in this, uh, in this session. So now let me detail a bit more three key aspects of the ACT methodologies and give you uh, some illustration. I guess the audience today has already heard about the locked-in emission concept. And this is not only a concept, it is a reality. Locked-in emission could make a company miss the goal of its decarbonization, despite the company has set ambitious GHG reduction targets. So my first point is that every company shall have GHG reduction target in intensity and in absolute. It shall consider its gross expectation because the effort to do won't be the same if, for instance, the company plans to double its, its production. And basically, this is what you can see on the chart on the left end of, of, the, of, the, of the screen. Um, and then the company shall also consider the lifetime of, uh, of its assets, especially for high GAG intensive capitalistic business sectors, such as cement, steel, electric utilities, and so on. Because it would really be a bad idea to invest now in an asset that would undermine companies' abilities to transition and that would make the company burn its carbon budget faster than the climate science would, science would allow it to do. So I guess you understand my point on the fact that transparent and clear information about low carbon capex is important. But capex is not the only aspect to consider for transition. Indeed, the, the R&D is also really important. And some sectors bet on huge technical innovations to contribute to their transition. Innovation can be made on products or services, but also on production technologies, such as CCS, for instance. And I like this picture of the last century electric car, because we have here a technology that was already existing when my grand grandmother was only one year old. But this technology, is still not the one that the car manufacturers sell the most in the world, despite we have now the suitable context for it. More generally speaking, research and development can be done, can't be done only with a passive approach. This is why we think from an ACT uh, initiative perspective that it's really important to also look at the R&D investment of a company on low carbon technologies and innovation, and to look at how this fit with the company's decarbonation goal. Finally, in addition to that, it's also important to also consider the development of new low carbon business models. And it will be my last point. 
because as you can see on the chart on the left hand, if the development of the last century from the GAG emission perspective has been similar to climbing a hill, slowly carbonizing the global economy, well, we can say that the upcoming challenge for the decarbonization of the 21st century economy is like falling from a cliff, meaning a huge shift of paradigm regarding how companies will make business in the future, considering that most existing ones are based on high, are based sorry, on high emitting uh, models. And because we are not in the back to the future movie, actually nobody came back from the future explaining what this low carbon economy will look like. This is why it's important also from an act initiative perspective to look at the plans of the company regarding development of low carbon business models. I might be shocking, but maybe an oil and gas company should better bet on selling energy saving solutions than still betting on selling fossil fuels. Because what the world needs is to decrease the energy demands and to drastically slow down the use of fossil fuels. Maybe an additional point uh, to support my speech. My colleagues from the industry division are working on specific French sectoral transition pathway aligned with the national French low carbon strategy. And they demonstrated uh, for the cement sector that basically, even with all the known and unknown technological lever to decarbonize the cement sector in France, it's still impossible to reach the French NDC goal. Because for instance, only 20% of the cement factories in France are eligible to CCS technology knowing the ground characteristics. It means that cement companies in France will have to reconsider expected production and sales. Therefore, they should consider right now new business models to generate revenue with alternative low carbon cements and solutions in the low carbon French market at least. I hope you enjoyed this quick overview of what ACT framework and sectorial methodologies can provide to decision makers regarding the key strategic dimension to focus on in order to understand, challenge, and support the company's management regarding the decarbonization strategy of the company. The ACT methodologies are open source and they can be used directly by companies with or without trained consultancy support. But ACT methodologies can also be used by ESG analysts or benchmark developers. And this is where it's interesting to have the World Benchmarking Alliance point of view about how and why they use the ACT methodologies for the climate and energy benchmarks and what are the key learnings from the benchmarks. So Vicky, the floor is yours. I thank you all and I remain available for any clarification question. Thank you. Thank you, Romain, and thank you for setting that scene. Uh, and we will also get back to you uh, in the panel. Uh, and I encourage all the, um, uh, the, the, the participants today to post any questions that we can get to uh, also later on in the, in the panel. So thank you for that. Um, as, as Romain introduced, I'm here to also show you how the World Benchmarking Alliance is operationalizing the various ACT sectoral um, methodologies into publicly available benchmarks. First of all, I'll give you a few words of who we are. The World Benchmarking Alliance is an NGO and we were, find, we were found with the ID to support the fact that businesses has a key role to play in leading the transformational change that we want to see if we are serious about reaching the sustainable development goals. That's why the WBA, World Benchmarking Alliance, in short, we are developing methodologies or teaming up with methodology providers like the ACT Initiative to develop free and publicly available benchmark that actually measure and compare individual company performances on the deliverable of the SDGs. These benchmarks equip investors, governments, civil society and individuals and companies, including their boards, to, with the information they need to engage and step up. In doing so, we create a system that recognizes leadership and that creates accountability for those that lags behind. Within this framework, we also publish the climate and energy benchmarks. These climate and energy benchmarks measure the readiness of the companies to transition to a low carbon economy using the future oriented act methodologies. As, as Roman already said, tackling the climate crisis is, and its challenges as, and also its opportunities no longer suffices by having a rear view mirror. A forward looking perspective is needed and this is crucial for boards to be able to challenge and identify the risks and opportunities. And this is what the ACT methodology and the benchmark does. 
The assessments use the company's emission pathway based upon the sectoral decarbonization approach, as Roman said, from the Science-Based Targets Initiative, in order to assess the individual company's pathway and achieving their in, uh, individual roads to the Paris Agreement. The benchmark detracts the most influential company around the globe in the high emitting sectors uh, that Rom Romain mentioned. These vary from electric utilities to um, uh, automotive to heavy machinery, as well as the oil and gas sector. The benchmark are actually a translation of societal expectation and its best available science, and that can be used as a guidance for companies and employees, their managers, CEOs, and its boards. To make this very concrete, I give you an example of the electric utility benchmark and the findings that we did last year. So we, for the electric utility benchmark, we selected the 50 most influential uh, electric utility generators around the globe. Out of the 50, we saw that only four companies have actually set fully Paris aligned emission reduction targets. And many of the other companies who did have set targets were actually considered, the targets were actually considered not enough or not ambitious enough. So that's why we said that we need to see bold actions because otherwise these companies will fall further behind on their decarbonization pathway. One of the examples is that uh, in the electric utility sector is facing that the asset lifetime of their port portfolio is relatively long. That's why it's important, for example, to set the time horizon of your emission targets that, that has the credibility that is actually encompassing the full portfolio. So the longevity of the fossil fuel assets in this case, that your company must ensure that they set these targets that are long enough to cover these emissions that are already locked in by these assets. Another found finding was that we saw that 42 of these companies have actually a low carbon transition plan, but um, if we look very close into what this transition, transition plan means is that there was, it, it was backed up with insufficient actions. And this is also what we saw earlier this week. We saw that the companies are not uh, putting up enough commitment on high level strategic buy-in and that, that uh, also comprehensive long-term financial strat finance strategy and transparency was missing. One thing that was a cru crucial finding, and I think this also resonates with the people that we have here today, is that, that from the evidence states that 90% of the companies, we saw that either the ties still exists between executive remuneration and the fossil fuel capacity growth, or it was unclear or not transparent that these ties have been cut. So linking remuneration to fossil fuel expansion creates obviously a conflict of interest, and this could result in weak commitment to deliver the low carbon transition plan. We also saw that the percentage of installed capacity for renewables is actually lagging behind. Only the 12% of the overall installed capacity was considered being renewable and still 60% was heavily relying on coal, oil and gas. So of course we want to see this percentage significant grow in the coming years. So we do these, <coughs> excuse me, these benchmarks on an iterative basis to make sure that we, we measure the progress in the future. The last point, and that was also the point that Romain made, is an important point around investment, capex investments, as well as R&D expenditures to drive the decarbonization. We want to see that companies are actually investing into new research and developments to back up the decarbonization that we want to see. These examples of actionable recommendations for a company and its board is, is, is important to reflect on and to implement. These benchmarks are iterative and we encourage the companies always to engage with us in terms of data collection, but also when we publish the benchmark. All the results, this was an example of one of our industries, but we have multiple industries available. You can access them on our website and it's freely available. So now it is time to go to the inevitable policy response. And I'm looking forward to give the floor to Charlotte Gard, who will tell us more about the uh, European uh, finance framework. Thank you, Charlotte. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I hope you can hear me, actually. I've put the video on, but... Okay, it looks yes. better now. 
<laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the for the invite. Uh, and I'm very, I mean, I'm very much looking forward to to, to the Q and A session as well because my the presentation from my colleagues were very enlightening in, in this regard. Uh, I believe I can share my screen. Is that it? We will share the slides for you. Next okay. Time. Yes. Thank you. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, so indeed, I'm going to, to present a little bit the regulatory aspect of all this. Uh, and I, I, I mean, as Roma actually mentioned, I'm going to, to focus very much on the EU taxonomy and the ongoing work to enhance transition related transparency from companies uh, with the EU taxonomy. Um, maybe just to, to sort of like have that broader view of the EU taxonomy, I believe it is necessary to to point out again that transition is a multi multifaceted topic. And so in our view, and from a public policy perspective, we think that related corporate disclosure must reflect um, the different levers of transition by company. Um, as you can see on the right-hand side of this, of this slide, uh, we believe that there are more or less four levers for a transition plan of company. One of them is the acquisition and diversification of low carbon activities and products. The other one uh, is the decarbonization of core activities and hard to abate activities. Uh, one is the closure of brown, so-called brown assets. And one can be emissions offsetting via uh, CCS, CCU technologies and reforestation. In our view, the EU taxonomy plays a dual role uh, in this respect. I mean, it is a piece of the puzzle. Of course, uh, the EU taxonomy cannot solve the entire transition puzzle, but it's, it's, it's a piece that can actually help companies to uh, drive forward um, the transition at their level. And um, I really want you to have in mind sort of like this uh, four square uh, figure, which will be very important uh, in, the, in the continuation of my presentation to be able to understand uh, what role can corporate disclosure play. But again, corporate disclosure is one deliverable um, and it's very important in our view also to focus on what can be done actually before the information is actually disclosed. So at the level of the company and within the company uh, for transition. So uh, maybe if we go to the next slide, I just want to, to remind everyone of what the EU taxonomy is and what it, is not, what it isn't, sorry. So the EU taxonomy is actually at the core of the sustainable finance action plan that the European Commission published in 2018. Um, the European Commission had one thing in mind. It, it thought, okay, we have to drive forward the greening of the financial sector. Regulation is one tool that can do that. But if we do not share the same language of what is, what is actually transition, what is actually sustainability, we cannot drive forward um, this regulatory stream that we want to drive forward. And so this is why the, um, the whole sustainable, sustainable finance action plan of the European Commission, so everything you might have seen about labels, about greening instruments, greening products, about governance, actually lies in the EU taxonomy, which is that common language for transition and sustainability. Um, of course, one other important leg, let's say, is corporate disclosure, but that just go hand in hand with the EU taxonomy. So the taxonomy regulation, which was adopted um, at the end of 2019 and published in the official journal in, ju in June of 2020, actually recognizes the particularity of sectors where low carbon technologies are not yet commercialized. Um, it is very important to have in mind that it's not what we can call, I mean, I, I never use myself the adjective green taxonomy. I believe green doesn't mean anything. It's actually just a color. And people have in mind when you think about green, only let's say sustainable energy, um, maybe electric vehicle, and let's say that's it. And so just for the sake of communication, I always say sustainable taxonomy because it is actually the name of the taxonomy and the word green is actually nowhere in the regulation or in the sustainable finance action plan. So I believe this is important. Why am I saying that? Because when you open up the taxonomy um, and I always say that, I mean, you give that to a teenager and you say, that's what the EU considers as green. It's not, I mean, the teenager is not going to understand. It's going to see in their plastic, cement, um, I mean, emissive industries right now, but this is the whole point of the taxonomy. And, and I believe this is a very good tool in that regard, actually, is that it's taking the economy as a whole and the fact that, yes, 
a large part of the economy today is largely emissive. And I think the two presentations we've just seen and, and Romain's presentation in particular shows that. And so it's setting sustainability criteria to each of these activities. So of course in there, I mean, in the taxonomy, you've got already low carbon activities. These are activities, so-called NACE codes, where low carbon technologies are already available. And so the criteria in there are not likely to change over time because activities in there are already low carbon. But then you have a whole other part of the taxonomy. And I believe personally, at least, that it is a very important part of that taxonomy is transitional activities, activities that actually contribute to transition to a net zero economy by 2050. And there, the criteria that are set, the carbon neutrality criteria, carbon neutrality, which is at the core of the taxonomy regulation, um, are not necessarily, I mean, the criteria in there are not necessarily the criteria that can tell the company how to be carbon neutral, but it actually gets you close to that. Um, and the criteria, the criteria, sorry, are likely to be revised regularly and to be tightened over time as fast as the economy is actually consuming the carbon budget, the fastest actually the criteria are going to be tightened over time if the economy does not respond to that. Um, so this is a very important part of the taxonomy. And in there, you're gonna see all of the activities that right now are emissive. And so companies that right now are emissive, but are contributing to the transition via transition plans. And another part of the, of, of the classification is that enabling activity part. These are activities which enable emission reductions in the first two types of activities. So in there, you might find net network maintenance, as I put on the slide, but also uh, research and development, fundamental research, um, engineering, I mean, a whole lot of, activ of activities like that. But I just want you to have in mind that the EU taxonomy actually covers the sectors, so the NACE codes, because it is, it is based on, on the NACE classification, statistical classification, which are responsible for nearly 95% of greenhouse gas emissions in the European Union. So again, when you open up the taxonomy, there's not only renewable energy, for instance, it goes beyond that. And of course, renewable energy is at the heart uh, of, the, of the EU taxonomy, but still it's, it's larger than that. So in my view, it is very important to have that in mind because when you go to the next slide, you're going to see that are embedded into the regulation actually two main objectives to the taxonomy. The first objective is to provide that common language, that sort of like metric system for the greening of the financial sector. So again, it's sort of like setting the objective to be met, or if not the objective as transitional activities are concerned, is at least setting ambitious objectives for these activities to be met. And so it's setting that common language for transition and sustainability for the, for the financial sector. So everyone sort of like shares the same language in there. Why am I saying your language? Because at the end of the day, that taxonomy is going to feed into, if not already doing that, feed into the standardization of the financial sector. I mean, standardization of financial instruments or financial products. Uh, we are um, on the verge of having an equal label for financial products of having um, um, green bond standard, also transition bond standard, all of that. And so the taxonomy is going to feed into that. Um, but the second objective is to accompany the transition to carbon neutrality. And so for that, you need at the regulatory level to remove obstacles to the functioning of the internal market in financing the transition to um, sustainable projects, in particular in the framework of the European Green Deal. European Green Deal, which is going to accompany also the transition throughout the European Union, notably via the modification of existing regulations directives, which are called sectoral regulations directives because impacting um, very key sectors of the economy. The thing is that companies, and I think our next speaker is going to show that really well and much better than I do, but companies actually rely on multi-annual transition plans. And so reaching the taxonomy thresholds may require combining several decarbonization technologies on the same side. And the development of these technologies obviously cannot be achieved only you know, once at a time, it must be done gradually. And the current regulation only actually allows investments to be taxonomy aligned when these sustainability thresholds are reached. And so this is why 
we have made, I mean, the French administration has made a contribution to the European Commission and to the platform on social finance to feed into the transition work and to say that we must go beyond that binary approach of the taxonomy because as any mechanism where you've got a threshold is binary, either you have met the threshold or you have not. And so what we wanted to do with that contribution to the European Commission and actually the platform on social finance has produced a report last week which goes well into our, I mean, which fits really well with our thinking is that the taxonomy must also be able to standardize the transition plans of companies as soon as their decarbonization trajectory allows these companies to reach the so-called sustainability thresholds of the taxonomy. And in that respect, let's say it's a two-sided coin. One side of the coin is that we must develop the trajectories which gets you to reach the sustainability threshold of the taxonomy. And the platform has made that really clear in its report published last week. And the other side of the coin is that a company must be able to disclose as part of its taxonomy, so-called taxonomy disclosure, to disclose what are, I mean, what is the investment plan? What are the CAPEX, the OPEX, but also any other related finance, any other related governance aspect that can get you to be on that trajectory and to meet the threshold at the end of the day. And that's why we think it's very important to sort of um, adopt these two sides of the coin and to adopt them gradually, but not only to go on disclosure, but also to go on the trajectory development part. Um, and we need also to certify, let's say certify these trajectories because as soon as we presented that approach to the Paris marketplace, for instance, or as soon as we discussed that amongst member states, one question always came up, greenwashing. Why? Because the taxonomy, again, sets thresholds of sustainability. And so we wouldn't want a company to be able to use, I'm, I'm going to put it very simply, obviously it's much more complicated than that, but let's say we do not want a company to be able to use the word taxonomy you know, hundred times in the annual report when the company has actually is not even trying to get near these thresholds and is not even near these thresholds. Obviously, we do not want that. The taxonomy must be a very robust um, classification that allows, again, for common language for sustainability in the EU. But at least if the company can show what it is actually doing to make sure it's reaching these thresholds, so then we're going beyond that binary approach and we can aim for even a voluntary use of the taxonomy by the financial sector to attach the taxonomy to other kinds of instruments and not just, let's say, stamp already green instruments. We think we must go beyond that because sustainable finance cannot only be a niche. And so we need to be able, I mean, to, to, to have a disclosure which is actually robust. And so it does not get you to greenwashing, but it actually helps you out as a company to publish your transition plan. So I'll go really quickly on the other slide uh, because I think I already made myself clear about that. But let's say that in our view, the taxonomy is an indisputable tool for the development of transitional finance because there is a dual objective for the financial sector if we develop that transition component of the taxonomy. And that's why I'm explaining in the next slide. I don't know if you, if you can see it, but let's say that the first objective is to be able to share a common understanding of the path of companies towards the sustainability thresholds of the taxonomy. And the second objective is to ensure that the taxonomy is the science-based reference on transition and sustainability for the entire financial sector. And we need to broaden its use and it's actually being done through, I mean, by a lot of regulations but it needs to go even further than that. And that's what the European Commission wants to do with its, with its renewed sustainable finance strategy by putting the taxonomy at the core of that transition finance plan that the European Commission has got for the financial sector. And so that's what I explained the next two slides really quickly, but just to say that we need with the taxonomy and with that delegated act under article eight of the taxonomy preparation, which is under preparation right now to say that we need to standardize business transition plans to include improvement measures to stay on track within capital expenditure aligned with the taxonomy. That's a core issue to be, um, to be tackled in the coming months because that delegated act under Article 8 must be adopted before June of this year. Another um, 
tool is to actually expand the potential use of the taxonomy via potential linkage, even voluntary one. I mean, there's no regulation that tells you to do that right now, but linkage to sustainability link instruments and transition bonds instruments also. So we need to develop also standards at the European level and the taxonomy can be at the core of that. And then, and finally, what I'm putting um, in my last slide is the fact that if we develop that transition component of the taxonomy, we can also make the taxonomy contribute to the assessment and to the management of transition risk by market participants. Of course, the taxonomy is not, you know, um, is, I mean, again, it's a piece of the puzzle. We're not saying that it answers everything, but it's an important piece of the puzzle. And we have to have that common language. And so um, including for transition risk management, let's say if we see that the company is so far away from its decarbonation trajectory, so basically in a very simplistic way, I mean, I'm explaining that right now, but let's say that it's putting at risk the portfolio of the bank, of the investment manager, because it is so not aligned with the trajectory based, uh, I mean, set, sorry, by the taxonomy. And so let's say that this is going to be the next step as regards the taxonomy file in the European Union uh, beyond what we might have seen until now. We've set the objective. So now let's say the pathways and the disclosure to, um, to, to be transparent about these pathways. I hope that was clear enough. Very clear, Charlotte. Thank you so much. And I know it's a very uh, extensive topic. So uh, thank you for capturing this in a, in a few slides. And I think this is, should be very appealing to, to the audience because it makes it very tangible of what is to expect. And uh, especially if we talk about uh, the, 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 the finance raising or capital raising of these companies in the future and what they need to take into account. So um, a lot of there to come. Um, thank you for that. And please, in the audience, if there's any questions, put them in the, don't hesitate, put them in the Q&A. And now we go to an interactive section with uh, Antonio. Antonio, thank you for being here and making the time available. Um, and uh, as mentioned or introduced, you're uh, the head of climate and energy at Lafarge Holcim, um, well known, uh, hopefully in the uh, in in the in, with the participants. Um, but we also know that there's a lot of challenges in the cement uh, sector, uh, and uh, we would like to know that. Uh, we would start off this initial question if you could, um, you know, take us a little bit on your journey of what uh, Lafarge Sim has has done in order to, you know, address the challenges, the risks, and opportunities that, uh, you know, the whole decarbonization of of such a, uh, nah, yeah, an important sector uh, brings. Thanks, Vicky. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, indeed. I mean, uh, uh, with uh, concrete uh, being the second most uh, uh, material used in the world after water, I think the challenge, uh, but also the opportunity is, uh, is clear. Uh, and at Lafarge also being the largest uh, cement producer worldwide, we we're in the spotlight. And, and as a leading company, we needed to, really to, to, to move ahead uh, with this. Uh, uh, with, with this uh, to be part of the solution and uh, not part of the problem. So um, I think what we've done, if, if, if you want me to explain is we've uh, quite, there's a, a bit of an heritage uh, in the past uh, on climate action uh, for both companies, uh, the Farch and Holcim. But, but in, in September, 2020, um, we signed the business ambition for 1.5 degree scenario. Uh, we were the first building material companies doing so with intermediate targets. Uh, I think uh, Romain was mentioning before how important it is to have uh, intermediate steps. Uh, those intermediate targets were validated by science-based target initiative. Uh, so making sure that uh, it follows uh, the science uh, behind this trajectory. And, um, uh, and, and we, we've set up a bit of a new reference in the sector. So this, this 475 kilogram of CO2 per ton of cement tissues is the most ambitious target among international peers, uh, and it's already being replicated by some uh, of our colleagues. So uh, we, we want to believe we're pushing a little bit the um, um, uh, the, the, the industry, or, or uh, we're doing our best uh, at least to, to, to do our bit. Uh, and be, beyond that, uh, we were also partnering with SBTI, with Science Based Target Initiative, to define what is going to be the first uh, 1.5 degree scenario uh, roadmap for, for, for the sector. Um, I think we, we're working, I mean, uh, to be very transparent on the traditional decarbonization levers uh, today to, to, to 2030, we're going to, to push and to, to strengthen the deployment of uh, uh, 
uh, well-known uh, decarbonization techniques like replacing of, uh, uh, of clean care, which is the most intense material into other mineral components, uh, changing the fuel mix to, 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 uh, 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 to less uh, uh, CO2 emission uh, um, uh, fuels, uh, exploring new alternative raw materials, and obviously in the scope to move into to renewables uh, uh, and, and power purchase agreements. Um, and, and also to transfer these into the products, really commercializing new, uh, new what we call green concretes, uh, our eco-packed uh, concretes that, are, uh, that have a, a reduction of CO2 versus the, the average, uh, are helping us to really deploy this, uh, um, this ambition into the market and in the end into the products that we commercialize, which is uh, eventually what we do. Yeah, thanks, Antonio. And 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 to take that one step further, how do you how did you um, implement this also in the in the company's culture and 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 governance in the end? And one thing that we mentioned is that one of the findings that we saw earlier this week in the in the Climate Action One Hundred, but also the findings that we made mm -hmm. is that the ties between executive pay and and the growth in 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 the portfolio that is quite emission intensive. So could you elaborate yeah. a little bit on this? Uh, how how did you tackle this within your company? No, massive, massive topic governance. I think it's uh, it's fundamental to be to be quite transparent. Um, um, since nineteen, since two thousand nineteen, uh, September around September, the company uh, uh, nominated a new chief sustainability officer, Magali Anderson, and she's uh, now sitting in the exco, the executive committee. That that was not the case before. So uh, I can tell you that. Uh, with sustainability sitting at the heart of the decision making, everything has changed. Uh, the drive has been fantastic. The integration of sustainability aspects, not only climate, but also water, circular economy, uh, human rights, et cetera, et cetera, into the company uh, business uh, uh, strategy and, and culture has been, has been fantastic. Uh, many things happen. I think those, those tools are fundamental. For example, uh, the fact that we have linked our uh, ambition of 2030 to a sustainability link bond, uh, uh, which obviously helps to finance, but we will get a penalty in, in, uh, in, the, in the coming years if we don't reach that target. Th th those sort of tools have, are fundamental to, uh, uh, to, to make sure that you walk the talk. And, and also coming back a little bit to, to this uh, comment from Roman uh, about the intermediate targets, I think you, you briefly mentioned, we also have set up a 2022 target. You know, 2030 is, uh, is a long way there. Uh, probably most of the management uh, people that are in the company now will not be uh, around in the company uh, um, in 2030. So, so we wanted to make sure that we have now incentives. So uh, top management has uh, linked the uh, compensation or part of the compensation uh, to this uh, target of 550, which is aligned with the pathway we want to achieve. Uh, this, this is one, one of those elements we're actually integrating. Um, I can also mention about the frequent uh, the frequency of reporting. Maybe might might sound not much exciting, but I think it's a key element so that the executive committee, the the CEOs of our subsidiaries of our business units, need to report uh, and to monitor on a frequent basis, more than yearly, which many companies do sustainability only on a, once per year. We we are tackling this uh, quarterly and now moving to monthly. I think that also mm, changed totally the mindset. Um, uh, the fact that we've got a, an executive, uh, sorry, a, a health and safety and sustainability uh, committee at the board of directors to which the C CSO and the CEO of the company needs to report on a frequent basis, on a quarterly basis about uh, strategy development, execution plans, uh, um, low carbon investments, uh, uh, approval, uh, all these mechanisms, all these governance make really uh, the difference to what the talk, no? because everyone can pledge, everyone can say we will do this by 2050, but uh, I think what defines a company is, uh, is the actions we do now. And, and about, about the transition, I think the latest um, fresh news that I would like to share is very recently, we've announced that uh, we've, uh, we've uh, going to go in favor of the say on climate. So we will put our climate transition plan uh, to, to uh, uh, consultation with our shareholders in, the, in, in 2022 uh, AGM, which I think it's, it shows a little bit the change of mindset and, and, and the change of, uh, of uh, how this culture and how management is, is so much involved and so much integrated into this topic. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Antonio, because I think that uh, it's great that you mentioned the, the Say on Climate uh, initiative. And we saw, of course, earlier this week or late last week uh, that the SEC announced also that the, had the shareholder vote on scope three emissions 
and also the identification of the Climate Action 100 on the fact that there's a, often a blind spot on the scope three emission discussion. So um, in this transition plan that you mentioned that you're going to put forward on, on the same, during the same on climate uh, to DHM, is there, a, is there also scope three emissions included or how are you dealing with the scope three emission uh, discussion? Yeah, we, 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 as part of the pledge uh, that you are seeing the screen, we, um, we have uh, committed to scope three targets. Uh, uh, we have done a solid um, reshape of our account. You know, scope three has a challenge in terms of accounting. I think cement industry has uh, pros and cons, but, but our, our main emissions for are, are scope one. So I think around, uh, out of memory, uh, 60, 70% of our scope uh, uh, our, our emissions are coming from scope one. Scope three emissions, though, uh, are not negligible, so we are tackling that. Uh, we don't need to wait until the AGM next year. It's all available in the website, so we've got a, a target to reduce by 2030. Focus uh, uh, among the, the main categories of scope three emissions, the most material, transportation of our products. Uh, obviously, all the transport of, of the ready mix and cement uh, by, by, by road and, and by boat, but also on the purchase goods that, that basically we use to, to, to operate our facilities. So I think that's the two main categories we're tackling. Uh, commuting, uh, business travels, uh, especially now with the COVID, obviously, it's totally negligible. So, so you, you will not find those, but no, scope three emission is, is fundamental. And more importantly, it, it's, it's, a, it's a mindset that needs to, to change because, uh, uh, for example, for us, Addressing our scope one emissions in the products that we uh, come up with, uh, low carbon cements, low carbon concrete, will help scope three emissions of the value chain. So, so if a builder wants to, you know, specifications from architects, uh, I think how, how construction value chain, uh, I don't know who mentioned from the panelists, uh, but, but these ecosystems that a value chain has are fundamental to link the scope one emissions with the scope three emissions of the other. So, no, absolutely, you, you will find that uh, there. Um, but you know, interestingly, for example, when we when we came back to to science-based target initiative to validate our targets, uh, uh, our uh, our uh, uh, sector is excused to to commit. So we, we it's a voluntary commitment, the one we have. But uh, from from a science-based target perspective, uh, uh, we only requested to do scope one and two. I mean, this is one of the things that is interesting to see how it evolves in the future. But uh, no, definitely, scope three is part of our uh, focus. Yeah, thanks, uh, Antonio. And and one other thing that you mentioned, hey, you, you already mentioned the investors as an important stakeholders, and now yeah. you also uh, mention, of course, other uh, players in your in in the value chain. Uh, can you can you elaborate a little bit on? Um, and we often hear that that this transition is also uh, it. it uh, we often talk about the costs of the transition, but not necessarily about the commercial opportunities. How, can you elaborate on how these discussions are, are going with your um, with your clients and your customers in the supply chain and also then within your company? How do you go about uh, these these type of often heard challenges? Yeah, well, I think you mentioned two group of stakeholders, not not uh, entirely related, uh, but so if, from investors, what we see it's a. Uh, uh, Increasing attention on on this topic. I mean, I, I don't I don't uh, uh, remember in the last year and a half an investor call in which CO two has not been a topic, right? So so the, uh, uh, the scrutiny of our transition plan, the requirement of uh, the long term incentives linked to to our uh, targets, uh, uh, the disclosure of our capex uh, commitments, uh, uh, a little bit aligned with the taxonomy. Uh, it's it's uh, it's key, no? An ESG rating agency, all these benchmarks are just growing, no? I think I saw a question there in the Q and A about sustainability, MSCI, CDP. I mean, uh, it's it's uh, it's crazy, no? But it's good because in the end, hopefully, it's some somewhere uh, they will convert into something because companies are uh, getting a bit crazy with so many. Uh, uh, um, repositories to, to fill, but, but I think it shows the, the, the attention and the acknowledgement that the uh, investment community is having. And I think that's key to drive really uh, uh, performance and action. Uh, uh, and then on the clients, uh, look, we, we could not expect the reaction. Uh, well, I mean, we wanted to take a bold step with this eco pack brand uh, uh, and, and, and low carbon cements that are about to, 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 be, to be launched. Uh, our eco labels. So we really want to be transparent in, in, in the footprint of our products. Uh, and and what we found in the market, obviously we started with EcoPack. We, we launched we launched it in Germany and Switzerland, but now it's expanded to to a number of countries in in all geographies. Uh, 
the, the acceptance has been massive. Uh, th there was a, there is a demand of low carbon product in construction. Uh, and obviously, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's commercially it's, it's, it's attractive for the company, but more importantly, the, the, the fact that we can link uh, the, the execution of our commitment uh, of our global targets it, while supporting the commitment of our customers also to reduce scope, scope three emissions, right? So, so I think it's all interlink. Uh, uh, it, it's beautiful to see how this is uh, getting traction, and um, yeah, it's it's very exciting. I think uh, th those two groups are really driving uh, a lot of, of the things that are happening. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and uh, I have to be mindful of time. I would be uh, not a good yeah. moderator if I let this run over. But I have not one last question because, and uh, and that's actually twofold. One is uh, how could what would your recommendation be to uh, companies and their boards that are still at the at the early days of of this transition? And then second, what how can they challenge uh, then afterwards the execution of of, of a plan like yours? Wow. Uh, okay. Two, two different questions. So, so I think uh, on the first one, um, to, to put together a strategy plan on decarbonization, there, there are main four steps. The first one is you need to understand your footprint. You mentioned about scope three, but it's also about scope one. Scope well, You need to understand your footprint. You need to do a thorough assessment of uh, what are your emissions uh, sources and, and, and document them well and have a robust accounting process. This will help you also to monitor progress. The, the second is to have a bold uh, ambition. You really need to go bold. You, you, you should think not only with the restrictions now, but also where you want to go in the future, how you want to drive it. Uh, the third one is to get these uh, assessments or targets or goals validated by a third party to give credibility, uh, but also to get informed from trends and expectations, uh, a science-based target initiative or any other. Uh, and the fourth one is really to run on execution and, and to monitor an execution, you really need to have systems in place. We've mentioned about governance uh, processes uh, like, like incentives, link, uh, um, um, frequent uh, accounting, monitoring. Uh, you need to put all the processes in place so, so you, can, you can follow up as, as uh, this was uh, any other economic or financial uh, aspect in the company, which, which uh, for sure they will already be be monitoring. You know? So I think that that would have, and the second question was, sorry, I forgot already. <laughs> no, is how can the boards uh, be involved to challenge the execution? And I think it's a related question from the audience as well. Have you ever heard that the board have challenged, you know, the, the plan? Oh, to oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. No, I think, uh, well, you need to set up a, a, a frequency of interactions with, with the, with the experts, uh, you need to be informed by the expert, by the people working in the operation, and, and you need to challenge, of course, the the, the, the question. So, uh, how we do it? Uh, I think I mentioned this uh, this quarterly meeting on the health and safety and sustainability uh, committee at the board, where the CEO of the company, the president of the company, and the CSO, the chief sustainability officer, need to go and present and exchange what are the plans, uh, what is what is the the execution, uh, and what does it need to take uh, to take where? No, so. I think this discussion is fundamental both ways to be challenged and to be accurate in the way things are presented. No, in the end, it's 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 uh, it's it's, a, it's no longer an add-on. Huh? I think I think this is the main the main concept here. <clears throat> Sustainability a few years ago, uh, you could have a sustainability report uh, aside of your financial report. That's a bad sign because it means probably it's not integrated. You no, know? <clears throat> this is a company. This is a company thing. Uh, it's about survival of the company and positioning now, today, for how the future is going to be, and it should be fully integrated. Thank you, Antonio. I think that's a great uh, remark to, to end on. And, and to quickly summarize what, what we discussed uh, today and uh, what, what I've heard at least is that um, and to to start off with what Antonio ended with is uh, put this at the heart of your organization this is not about uh, competition but this is more about surviving also in the future and this this is, is is no longer a question of is it needed but really about how so to start off with putting a plan in place um, and to make sure that any long-term ambitions uh, has to be backed up by clear strategies and also robust short and medium targets and also a clear transition and scenario planning. 
in which and Romain shared this, uh, the ACT methodologies could help to provide clear guidance on how you to get there and give accountability on how the company is doing compared to what is needed. There also be, needs to be clear insight into future investments, also in line with uh, the, the, the future or the, the, not the future, the European taxonomy. Uh, and this needs to be clearly in line with the net zero transition that we want to see. And we want uh, to see that the corporate boards and executive management team want to get involved to challenge and to get involved in disclosing on the climate change governance. We, we recognize that this transition is not easy. It needs to happen at a scale and a pace that is unprecedented, but a lack of action is more dangerous than the uncertainty that the transition is bringing. So it is up to all of us to, on this, uh, to deliver on this ambitious agenda and with true actionable outcomes and changes in the real economy. Last but not least, I want to say thank you for all the participants and I would like to remind the French attendees that it's possible to become a member of the Chapter Zero France. Uh, at the end of this, we'll also give you a feedback form to uh, give you very short uh, uh, feedback on what you thought of this panel for us to continuously improve for the future. I want to thank you very much. Stay safe, everyone, and I hope we can meet each other in person uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.